somewhere around uh, 15, 16 years ago when I was pastoring First Dallas, Deb and I flew out to Las Vegas. We were helping plan a church uh, in that city, and we were working with a number of churches. Johnny Nance, who's now going to be with the Lord, was one of the first Baptist church plants out there, was there for 25 years. Great, great guy. We were working with him. We were working uh, with a couple of other churches. And of course, at night, we'd go down the, the Vegas Strip. I was fascinated with it, uh, not because I'm fa- I kept having to pull Debbie out of casinos constantly, but <laughs> not because I'm, I, gambling holds no attraction to me whatsoever. And, uh, but walking into Caesar's Palace where guys are walking around dressed like Romans, now that just flips my switch. I'm kind of fascinated with that. And I wanted to see some of these places. One of them happened to be um, the Luxor, because I've been to Egypt a number of times and had taken groups there. Uh, I wanted to see this pyramid that was built after the Great Pyramid of Khufu. And uh, so we went there, and they've got a big, uh, this huge sphinx that's in front of it. And uh, they had a river that went through it they call the Nile River. It's a pretty fascinating place. But do you see that light on the top right there? That is the brightest light on the face of the planet. It burns with something like 42 to 48 billion, billion candle watt power. That's like giving every single person on the face of the earth six or seven candles and lighting it all at the same time. That thing heats up to be 800 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you wonder, what does it cost to run? Because that was the first thing in my mind. What does it cost to run something like that? You just take your average monthly bill here, power bill. That's what it takes to run that for an hour. Now, that light is so bright that it shines 250, 275 miles away. The interesting thing is this. Pilots that land at LAX say that on a clear night, they can see the light of the Luxor. <laughs> and beyond that, those that have been on the space shuttle say that uh, when they come over the western part of the United States, they can look down, they can see the light of the Luxor. Now, here's the fascinating thing. When you're down on the Vegas Strip, you never see it. You never look at it. Do you know why? Because there are a million, million other cheap, colored lights that have got your attention. Jesus walks into the temple, John chapter 7, to a people that are dry and thirsty and parched spiritually, and he says this, whoever is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes, now listen to what he says, he who believes in me, as the scripture says, out of him will flow rivers of living water. Jesus walks into a temple where people are wandering in absolute spiritual darkness. And Jesus cries out, I am the light of the world. He who follows, now did you get that in chapter 7? He who believes, now chapter 8, he who follows becomes my disciple. He who believes and then follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. Now listen, that little phrase, if you look at it, light of life, at the end of verse 12, John chapter 8, sets up everything else in this chapter. In the Greek, the word is literally phos, tes, zoes. It's lyrical. It rhymes. Phos, photograph. Uh, Zoes, zoology, life. Phos, Jesus cries out and he says, Phos tes zoes. You hear it. It, it. It's lyrical. It's rhythmical. And you think about that, the light of life. What Jesus was saying, it's a genitive, but it's not just a genitive of possession. It's not that I just possess this inner light if I come to Christ. It's, the concept is this, is that that light then possesses me and changes who I am eternally. Father, over the next few moments as we open your word and listen to you and to what you are saying to us, Father, in these moments when we could be so like the scribes and the Pharisees and be offended at everything that is said, 
Help us, Lord, to have a spirit that says, Speak, Lord, your servant listens. For I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is in the temple. You are in the Feast of Tabernacles. I can't say Feast of Booths anymore because everybody thinks I'm saying Feast of Booze. And what is that Baptist preacher saying? Uh, my southern accent, everybody in Alabama should understand. Feast of Tabernacles. He's come into the temple, temple in chapter 7. This goes all the way through into chapter 10. And uh, you're going to see next week, because I'm going to rapidly get there, to this blind man. He's going to open his eyes, which is his whole thing of illumination. You've got this whole thing of the light of Christ. And apart from the light of Christ, you'll never, n- listen, apart from the light of Christ, you never know truth. It's only in the light of Christ that you know truth. But in chapter 8 of John's gospel, they're rejecting who Jesus is. Now, let me just do a few moments of teaching, and let me walk you through this. I hope you've got a text, and you'll follow this. Here they come with a word of contradict. There's a six steps down to the rejection of Christ. They come in verse 13 with a word of contradiction. The Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. You're contradicting yourself. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. But that's the first step down. Verse 19 is the step down of cynicism. So they were saying to him, where's your father? Now, let me me just let you in. They're going to question his paternity. They're going to question his birth. And so this is where it starts, and they start out with a word of cynicism. Come down to verse 33. They answered him, uh, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been enslaved to anyone. That's a word of denial. They're denying who Jesus is, but they're, listen, they're denying their own history and, their, and the reality of who they really are. Verse 48 is an insult. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you're a Samaritan? Now, you could not use, I could not use another pejorative term for these Jews 2,000 years ago that is nastier than that. To call somebody a Samaritan was just nasty. It was bad. It was terrible. Do we not rightly say, so they're insulting him. You're a Samaritan, and on top of that, you're demon-possessed. Verse 53, now watch, they come with sarcasm. You're not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. Who do you make yourself out to be? Just who in the world do you think you are? Here's the sarcasm, but now watch, it gets so bad. Verse 59, here's the violence. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple. Now, there are the six steps down of rejection. They've rejected the light the only light that would ever reveal the truth to them. Now, let me quickly give you three things here in this passage, and you're going to have to follow along in the text with me. First of all, apart from the light of Christ, apart from his light, you will never see yourself. You'll never see who you really are apart from his light. Now, let's go back to verse 13, and let me pick it up right there. So the Pharisees said to him, you're testifying about yourself. Your testimony's not true. Now, they bring up an issue of judicial Hebraic law, and that is the law of the Hebrews said this. There had to be two witnesses for anything. Now, you just saw that back in the early part of chapter 8 where they brought the woman caught in adultery, and uh, I went through that whole process that there had to be two witnesses Uh, to an event. So they're coming to Jesus, and they're saying to Jesus, "Um, you're bearing witness of yourself. Now, uh, in all honesty, he could. In a Hebrew court of law, just as in our court of law, you see, Jesus is going to answer this in verse 14. Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. I can bear witness in a case uh, that I'm involved in for myself. Jesus is saying, sure, I can do that. I'm testifying, and the Father testifies who I am. What they were doing was this. They were looking for some technicality somewhere to say, you are not the Messiah. You're not the Son of God. Now, the amazing thing to me is this, is that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people right around here, right around Valleydale, 
who are constantly looking at some little technicality to say, well, now I'm not gonna believe. Well, I don't believe. I've got questions. You talk about a virgin birth. I don't understand what you're talking about, a virgin birth. That doesn't even make any sense. I, I, I'm not sure about that, so I just don't believe. Um, you got somebody else who comes at me and says, you know what, you, you believe chapter 11. I had somebody ask me just after the last service, walking out of here. Guest just asked me, he said, do you believe the Bible is inerrant? I said, absolutely I do. I believe it's inerrant and infallible. You know, and some, and some people will come up and say, well, do you believe in six literal days of creation? Yes, I believe in six literal days of creation. Lord have mercy. Well, I've got problems with that, and I'm not sure about that. What happened to the dinosaurs? Like, what in the devil does that matter about anything? I'm just not going to believe. I've got some little technicality out there that keeps me from believing in Jesus Christ, that he is who he says he is. D.L. Moody was preaching one night in Chicago in the middle of his preaching. Nobody do this. There's a guy stood up and called out and said, if you'll tell me where Cain got his wife, I'll believe. And D.L. Moody looked back at him and he said, you won't be the first man to die and go to hell worried about another man's wife. <laughs> Let me tell you something. A technical, I've got some little technical, here are the scribes and the Pharisees. I've got a technicality right here, so I'm not going to believe. Now, watch what Jesus is going to do. He's going to say, you don't have light. You don't know who you are. You cannot see yourself honestly apart from the light of Christ. And Christ is going to do it by showing who he is. Now, go back to the text. Verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. Now, watch. For I know where I came from. He says, there is no question in my mind. I know where I came from. In other words, I know who I am. I know my purpose. I know my meaning in life. I know why I'm here. I know where I came from. In fact, if you look at this, if you get all the way over to verse 58, and I'll never get over to these verses today, but now watch it, what Jesus says to them. He says, I know exactly where I came from. In all honesty, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Jesus was saying, I'm from eternity past. I'm from before Abraham was ever conceived or thought of. He's saying essentially, I am God in the flesh. I know who I am. We live in an entire generation that doesn't have a clue who they are. We've got all this issue of gender dysphoria. And listen, my heart breaks for people who struggle in the midst of this confusion. But I want to tell you something. Apart from the light of Christ, you won't ever know who you are. Am I this? Am I that? Am I something else? Do I fit in another? Do you see how Satan has brought absolute total confusion to this world? and continues to bring even more of it to our world, to where people are walking around questioning all kinds of things. You know, what am I? Where do I fit? They keep having to add letters. L-G-B-T-Q-R-A. And I'm not making fun of this, but I'm just telling you, it's just mass confusion in our generation, and it's because we reject the light that shows us who we are. Amen. Just sit there. Amen. Jesus says, I know who I am. That builds a confidence. It builds an assurance to be able to share with those who are acoustic to you. But he says, not only that, I know who I am. Watch it, what he says next. He comes back there in that same verse, verse 14, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. I know where I'm headed. I know what my purpose is in life. I know why I've been sent. I know why I am here. He says, I know where I'm going. Now, it's always amazed me how some commentators and some theologians and some people say, Jesus got caught up in this thing, and you know, he had no idea they were going to arrest him and crucify him, and it was like everything got out of control. You know what that is? <laughs> Watch. Look what he says, verse 28. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man. And what is he referring to there? Every Hebrew mind would immediately go back to the passage in the Old Testament that everyone who hangs on a tree is cursed. That's exactly what they think when you, when you hear this, when I'm lifted up. When, when you lift up the Son of Man, 
Then you will know who I am. Jesus said, I know where I'm going. I'm headed to the cross. I'm headed to a cross to die for your sins. I'm headed to a cross to die for sins that, in a moment, I'm going to get to this, you don't even see. I'm headed to a cross to die for you, and you don't even know who you are. I know my purpose, and I know my meaning, and listen, I will accomplish what the Father sent me to do. If you've got a Bible, look over to John chapter, just stay in the Gospel of John. Look at John chapter 17 when you come to that high priestly prayer. Jesus uh, is praying, and uh, he comes in verse 4, and he says this, I glorified you on the earth. He's praying to the Father now. Here's God the Son praying to God the Father. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished, the word is teltelestai, or telestai, finished, having finished, having accomplished, having completed the work which you've given me to do. Jesus goes to the Father. He says, now I've done everything you told me to do. In fact, you get on over, if you look on over in John's gospel, chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus on the cross, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Tell tell us that. It's finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. It's finished. It's done. My wife will walk through the house and when she gets through with the task, that's that's the one thing she says, finished. Done and dusted. Finished. It's it's over with. That's what Jesus was saying on the cross. Finished. I've completed it. Now, I want to just be honest with you. I don't know that I've ever completed any task thoroughly. I get to the end of the week, and I look back on the week, and I think, well, you know, I should have called this person here and just, you know, just encouraged them. I should have gone to, I forgot to get by the hospital. I didn't make it by the hospital. You know, everything else came up to do, and um, then I should have read this book, and then I, I should have done that, and I should have spent a little bit more time on this, and i got to get back and work on that. And I get to Friday afternoon, I look back on my week, and I'd love to say, like Jesus, finish completely. I've completely finished, but I can't do that. I've never been able to do that in any area of my life to the extent that Jesus completed everything the Father sent him to do. He said, I not only have meaning in life, I know my purpose in life, and I'm going to accomplish it all in this life. In three short years, Jesus did everything that sovereign God gave him to do. And the amazing thing is this, is he's in the midst of a controversy right here. And in the midst of this controversy, he's still bearing witness of the gospel. He's still bearing witness of himself. In the middle of a hostile crowd that's coming at him, we're talking about world reach, and a lot of people are always concerned, well, I'm afraid, I'm I'm not real sure that I should go out. I don't know that I can share the gospel. Let me show you something. Look in verse 30. In verse 30 of this passage, now listen, this is a sweeping passage, a whole lot of movement. You've got a lot of things that are going on. I'm having to just pick at things here to give you to get through this chapter. But look at verse 30. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. We would say on him, they put their trust. They actually came in the midst of chaos, in the midst of confusion, in the midst of controversy, in the midst of anger, in the midst of fighting and fussing, in the midst of all that. There are some that still came to Jesus Christ and believed in him. So let me tell you, to go on world reach or to go next door to your neighbor, we're all, we draw back, we're afraid, we're timid, we say, I'm not so sure about that. Listen, let me tell you, God will give you fruit even in the midst of controversy, folks, even in the midst of confusion. And so Jesus stands up and he faces this. Now, we've got a generation who wants to shrink back from all of that and say, well, I'm not, I'm not real sure, you know, I don't know about I'm just going to do what my heart tells me to do, follow my dream, do all that. we got a whole generation that's that we're telling that to. I don't know why I started thinking about this early this morning in the study, but I did. I remember when I was about the sixth or seventh grade, my dad came to me with a poem by Rudyard Kipling, and he gave it to me, and he said, Son, you would do well to memorize this. If you can keep your head, now just think about Jesus in this. If you can keep your head when all of those about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you but make allowances for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, not deal in lies, or being hated, do not become wrapped up in hate. 
and never look too good while doing it or speak too wise. In other words, there's going to be difficulty and hardship in life. People are going to turn against you. People are going to speak against you. There are going to be those who will throw aspersions at you. Listen, all of that they did to Jesus, and yet Jesus stood with a calmness. If you can keep your head when everybody around you is losing theirs and blaming it on you. Do you know what we tell our generation? You've got to find your own truth. What in the devil is that? You, gotta, you have to find your own truth. You, you've got to trust your own passions. You've you got to follow your heart. All this kind of crazy stuff. I want you to know there was a study done at Stanford, not Samford, but Stanford and Yale University on that very phrase. And I want you to listen to what that study shows. According to a new study by researchers at Stanford University and Yale, that found that following your passion is likely to lead, now listen to this, to overly limited pursuits. And you just follow your passion. Well, I'm going to go out there and follow something that's easy for me to do. Overly limited pursuits with inflated expectations. I'm going to give everything. I just want to follow. I just want to do what I'm happy doing. I don't want to really try that, but I want the whole world to recognize what I'm doing is spectacular. That's what they're saying. Now, this is, these aren't Baptist schools. Stanford and Yale are very secular, humanistic institutions, and they ask this question, are you only looking to the self? I can't believe they said this, but it's in this study. Or are we looking outward and maybe upward as well. Let me tell you, to walk around with this self-communication that tells me how wonderful I am, how great I am, follow your heart, follow your path, do all this kind of stuff. Listen, I am walking in darkness until the light of Christ shines in my life and I see for the first time that I have a meaning and a purpose in life and God will fulfill it through me. Okay, well, I'll go to the second point since that one wasn't received too well. Let me get to this. Secondly, apart from his life, you can't see your sin. You can't see you. You can't see your sin. Now, let me pick it up down in verse 31. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed him, if you continue in my word. Now, I want you to notice who he's speaking to. He's not speaking to another crowd that's there. He's speaking to those that believed in him just as I'm preaching to you. However, we're all over the internet and uh, we're being live streamed right now. And so there are other people that are watching. Uh, there are other people that were watching and listening to Jesus that day. But Jesus is talking to his disciples. I'm preaching to the church. God called me to pastor. And Jesus says to them, if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples of mine. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, there is this other group out there that's going to speak. Not these disciples that believed on him, but these others, the scribes and the Pharisees, answered him, and they said, we are Abraham's descendants, and we've never been enslaved to anyone. Have you ever heard of 400 years of captivity in Egypt? They're not living in reality. Have you ever heard of 722, the Assyrian captivity of the 10 northern tribes of Israel? Or in 598, the invasion of Babylon, of Judah, and they went off into 70 years of captivity. They come back, and then the Seleucids reign over them. And then the Seleucids are driven out by the Maccabees, but for 100 years only, they have no one there, but in comes Pompey of Rome, invited in, by the way, by the Jews uh, who were warring against each other, one group was called Pharisees, the other group was called Sadducees, and they turned to Pompey, and they invited this Roman general to come in and settle this issue, and like all good Italians, they're like the mafia, they come in, and they don't ever leave. Now, they're there. They're, while they're saying this, they're under Roman occupation, and yet they look at Jesus because they have no sense of reality whatsoever and say, we, we've never been slaves. 
Now watch at Jesus' answer here. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly. He says, you're just thinking on the externals always. Look back at verse 15 for a moment. You judge according to the flesh. Jesus says, all you do is you look at the external. I'm talking about the spiritual. Well, physically they had been slaves, but now spiritually Jesus is saying, verse 34, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Have you ever sinned? Yes, you're a slave. There you go. You, you say, well, I, I don't know. Is that another technicality? I'm not real sure I believe that. Okay, well, good. Listen, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? That's just common sense. Either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. Jesus said, I'm not talking about physically. I'm telling you, you're in sin. You can't see your sin because you don't live in the light of life. Jesus goes on, look at verse 35. The slave, now here's the issue. The slave doesn't remain in the house forever. He said the slave doesn't stay in the house. Now they've been talking about Abraham, right? Back in verse 33, they said we're descendants of Abraham. What Jesus is doing is he's using a picture out of the house of Abraham that the slave did not stay there. Who was the slave? Come on, y'all. Hagar, who has Ishmael. Who does stay? The son stays. Who's the son? Isaac. So Jesus says, okay, you want to talk about Abraham? I'm going to bring that up. The slave does not remain in the house forever. Why? Because the slave doesn't really care for the father. He doesn't really care what the father says. He doesn't really care to do what the father tells him to do. He doesn't really care about the father at all. Now, let me tell you, the best thing I can do is go back to, you know what, you can get into this whole thing of when we were teenagers and we just wanted out of the father's house. I don't know, for some reason, my mama decided that, that I needed to take music. And so at about six years of age, I had to take piano and I absolutely hated it. I hated it. I thought to myself, when I can get out of this place, I'm getting out of this place. I am not going to practice this piano because this went on six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All these years, I ran teacher after teacher off. I mean, they went running out of there, you know, praying, you know, set me free from this demon here. Get me out of this. I hated it. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to come in and practice. I dreaded every Tuesday and Thursday that came along because we'd get in the car, we're going to, you know, or the music teacher's coming here, or we're going there. I hated it until I got 13. And when I got 13, they turned me over, you know, to the minister of music at the church. And they said, he will teach you music and you will learn it. And so I had to go to Milton Fisher and I would sit there twice a week, and I tell you what I started doing is I started making up my own rules. I started playing by ear. I figured out I could play by ear, and I didn't know those notes, and I was not going to learn those notes, and I was not going to practice that stuff. And so I started playing by ear, and recital time came up. And, I, you know, pick out any piece of music you want. This is 1970, 1971. You know, who was it? Who was the group? It, Gentlemen Four or whatever they were that did 1969 Traces. You know, faded photographs, memories of time together. Oh, son, I could play that thing. I could just rip on the piano and play that just incredibly. But it was all by ear. So they got me the music. I'd put the music up there like I was reading music. I'm just playing this thing. So I come to the recital, which is absolute, total cruelty to do that to a kid. Uh, I come to the recital, and in the middle of the recital, it's time for me to play. Milton Fisher, my music's teacher, minister of music at the church, you know, stands up, and he says, I think I'm going to play with Mac on the other piano. He has the music. I have music. It means nothing to me. He's got the music over there. He sits down. It's, it's obvious something horrible has happened. And he stands up in the middle of this. He stands up and he says, I apologize. I'm just going to let Mac play it. 
I just, man, I laid down on that thing. You know, traces, you know, faded photographs. I'm just playing that thing. I get through. I go sit down. I'm sweating bullets. The whole thing ends, and he walks up to me, and he leans over, and he says, caught. You're playing by ear. My piano career, over. Now, listen, I was thanking God. I am done. I'm, I can't wait to get out the Father's house. I'm, I can't wait to get out of this. I did not love what the Father was doing. I did not appreciate until I applied for college and needed a scholarship. And I went for a music scholarship, and I sang. And they send me out the room, and they bring me back in, and all the music professors there say, we're going to award you a music scholarship but first, we want to hear you play that piece you just sang on the piano. And I said, I can't do it. I can't play. I can't read music. And all of a sudden, in one fell swoop, all that the Father had done for me makes sense. It was not to hurt me. It was to do something for me. And all I could do was be agitated at the Father. That's what Jesus is saying here to these guys. He's saying this. Guys, all you want is your own glory in the Father's house. You're not interested in the Father. You could care less about the Father. You care nothing for the Father. You don't listen to what the Father says. You don't want to do what the Father tells you to do. He says, all you want is your own glory in the Father's house. And I want to tell you something. This is that you hear a pastor's heart because this is not an easy thing to say. But a lot of us in the house of God today are really not that interested in the Father but we love our own glory. We do what we do in the Father's house because it feeds our ego. And we do not do what we need to do in the Father's house because we really don't care about the Father's glory. You never see your sin until you stand in the light of Jesus Christ. Let me give you the last thing. The last thing is this. You know, apart from his light, apart from his light, you can't see salvation. Now I want to show you something that hit me Friday in the study early that I'd never seen in this passage before. I just never paid attention. Now watch, pick it up in verse 39. They answered Jesus and said to him, Abraham's our father. Now I told you, they're beginning to raise the issue of paternity here. We don't know who your father is. You don't know who your father is. We know all these backstreet rumors. Jesus said to them, if you're Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. He says, listen, you want to question my father? I'm questioning yours. You say, "Father, your father is Abraham, but you don't do what Abraham did. What did Abraham do? He was obedient to God and followed what God told him to do. And Jesus is going to tell them, listen, Abraham rejoiced. Verse 56, Abraham rejoiced to see my day, saw it, and was glad. Do you know what that is? He says, listen, if you are really sons of Abraham, you'd be glad to see me because Abraham was. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw that ram caught in a thicket and saw that there was a substitute for Isaac, and he saw that substitute and rejoiced. If you were Abraham's sons, you would see me, the substitute that's going to the cross for you, and you would rejoice over it, but you're not Abraham. You want to call my father into question? I'm calling your, your lineage into question as well. Watch, watch. This gets good. It's better than anything you find on TV. Watch this stuff. They said to him, verse 49, they said to him, we're not born of fornication. Oh, uh, now, I can't say it from a pulpit, and I wouldn't say it in here with women and children, but you know what they're saying. They're saying you're born out of an immoral situation. Then they dig a little deeper. We have one father. 
we're not so sure. People, you know, Mary was married to Joseph, but uh, we're not so sure. You talk about Joseph, you talk about this, somebody talks about somebody else. We're not sure, but we have one father. Well, they're really getting after it here, aren't they? God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, look at this, you'd love me. If it's true that God were your father, you'd love me. But the fact is, he's not your father. He's my father. Come down to verse 47. He says, you don't, you don't know the father because you don't love me. You cannot get to the father apart from Jesus Christ. You can't understand the word of God apart from Jesus Christ. Verse 47, he who is of God hears the words of God for this reason. You don't hear them. You don't understand a thing I'm saying. You can read this and never catch it if you live outside the light of Jesus Christ. None of this makes any sense. I can't make heads or tails out of any of this. Jesus said, apart from me, you can't know God, and you'll never understand what God is saying. The Jews answered and said to him, do we not rightly say, now watch this, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. I want you to see something in the midst of this controversy, in the midst, in, in the midst of this confusion, in the midst of this anger, this madness that's going on, this back and forth, they're calling Jesus names, they're questioning his paternity. You know, there are a lot of ways I could say this, but I can't say it easily from a pulpit. This is horrible stuff that's going on. This is ugly stuff. This is mean, nasty stuff that's going on. And in the middle of that, look at verse 51. Jesus looks at him and says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if you keep my word, you won't see death. Those of you that are calling me demon and Samaritan and questioning my birth, even now, in this moment, if you will keep my word, if you will believe in me, you'll not see death. That's a Savior right there. You know what I'd do if it were me? I'd zap the fire out of every one of them. I'd call fire down from heaven. I'd do something. I'd raise up the kraken, release the kraken. I'd turn the kraken loose on them. But I'm telling you, Jesus in that moment, in the midst, listen, in the midst of intense controversy, what comes out of Jesus when you squeeze him? He's a savior. He's a savior for you. He's a savior for every one of us. No matter what you've done, no matter the extent of your rejection, he comes and he said, right in the middle of this, if you'll just believe me, you'll never see death. I don't understand it. I don't understand it, but I want to tell you something. You follow this all through chapter 7, all into chapter 8. You follow it through the whole gospel of John. You follow it through all four of the gospels. You follow it through the whole of Scripture. You're going to see this scarlet thread. A number of years ago, we were, I started out talking about working with churches in Las Vegas. We were working with two churches in Boston, one in Chelsea, which is in the inner city, and one in Framingham, which was out in the suburbs. And um, we went on the Freedom Trail. If you've ever been to Boston, I'm sure you've seen the Freedom Trail up there. It goes past, you know, Fennel Hall, goes past where the Boston Massacre, it goes past the bay where they had the, uh, the tea party, uh, you know, all of that. And so years later, we were up there, and I took Debbie, I said, listen, I'm going to walk you through the Freedom Trail. And she says, what, what, where do we go? We don't have a guide. What are we going to do? And I said, just watch this. You see this right here in Boston? That's Fennel Hall back there behind them. You see this? See that red line right there? See those red bricks? Yes, pastor, we see that. You see? See that? For two and a half miles, there's a red line that wanders through the city of Boston and takes you past one significant, where your freedom was purchased. There's a red line through this word. There's a red line through history. And there's a red line that leads down to an altar where Jesus stands. And if the Son makes you free, that's when you're free. Let's stand.